turned it on. <laughs> Good morning. It is still two minutes away from me. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hope you all have a good day. Um, I am very pleased to introduce to you my colleague and friend, Keith Copes. Um, Keith, Keith uh, his research interests are um, on the cutting edge, if you would, uh, in the sense that he is very interested and much of his work revolves around understanding how offenders perceive themselves. Um, much of his work revolves around the notion that we all have various identities and those identities are, are projected to, uh, to others and uh, help to define ourselves to the other. And much of his work has revolved around how criminal offenders uh, project various identities um, <clears throat> and use those identities as a way of helping to understand who they are to themselves as well as who they are to others. Um, his work has looked at carjackers, it has looked at um, crack users. Um, one of his interesting pieces was uh, how crack users rent cars. <coughs> Uh, and, and, and use them to get around. Um, uh, they, they literally use, they barter drugs for cars. Um, so, and more recently, he and a colleague, former colleague of ours, uh, who's now at the University of Texas at Dallas, um, uh, Lynn Veritas, uh, wrote a book about identity thieves. And much of their work, uh, that work focused on how these people perceive themselves and uh, and, and similar kinds of issues. So his talk today is going to continue in this line of work uh, on how it is that offenders perceive themselves and how others perceive them. Uh, again, he's focusing on drug users. And with that, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, John. After that, I think uh, he's described everything I've done. So uh, I, I could leave now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to have a modest goal for today. I, I, every time I go to events that have free food, the food's usually not worth the pain of, of the talk. So my goal is to at least make the food worth it today. And fortunately, we ordered good food today, so I think I can accomplish that. And I know it's a lecture, but that seems so formal. So really, we're going to have a conversation with some pretty pictures and I'll just talk more than I normally would in a conversation. So as Dr. Sloan said, I'm Heath Copes. I'm in the Department of Justice Sciences. Um, my background is in sociology. So a lot of what I do really takes on a, a sociological um, influence. And today's talk, even though I have a, a kind of a vague title, the vague title was because when I had to give Rebecca the title, I was out of the country and I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, so I figured this was vague enough that I could wrap whatever I did decide to do into this topic. Um, but it's a simple question that I'm trying to answer here is, how do people make sense of their lives? Um, how do we create an identity that we project to others? How do we create these in-groups and out-groups? How do we show that we belong to this in-group, that we're authentic members, and that all the positive characteristics we would assign that in-group should be assigned to us? And how do we create these out-groups where we lump other people in there and they get classified with all the negative traits of the out-group? And, and that's really the key of what, what I'm trying to do. And now, the majority of my work does focus on offenders and drug users and violent people. But you shouldn't take this to mean that only people who violate social norms or, or who, who engage in potentially stigmatizing behavior construct identity in this way. We all do it. We do it every time, every day. It, I would imagine at some point during the, uh, the talk, you, I will reveal parts of my identity or how I want you to th think I am. Um, for example, I watch a lot of TV um, and I think a lot, there's a lot of really good shows nowadays that really get at this idea of identity. I think Mad Men is brilliant. Um, it really focuses on identity if you watch the entire series, but it's particularly good at looking at gendered identity. 
Um, Downton Abbey is great because it looks at um, social class and identity. But I also watch some trashy shows too. I like um, Big Brother and Survivor. And I think one reason I like it is because you get to watch people interact live, especially Big Brother. If you watch the feeds in the Big Brother After Dark, you can see people interact. You can see them construct identity right there. Um, most recently on Big Brother, it's airing now, two groups formed opposing alliances. And one group decided they were gonna try to recruit someone to their alliance. And they did so by creating this category of, we're the good people, those are the bad people. You wanna be with us, we're moms, we're good people. Even though they're all doing the same thing, they're all manipulating and lying, but they were still able to frame themselves as good and the others as bad. Um, so let's just you know, make it clear that we all do this. But I think it's easier to see these things, this process of identity, when we look at people who do engage in stigmatized behavior or people who are part of subcultures. Because when you're part of a subculture, authenticity really matters. It's really important. Um, if anybody is a part of a subculture, um, people make these distinctions between I'm real, it's who I am, versus these others who are posers and it's just what they do. They're, they're putting on a front. And so it's real common to see this. And another way we can see the, this process is when we go to new groups. I don't think I ever feel more Southern than when I go to another part of the country. And I never feel more American than when I go to another country. But when I'm here, I don't really think about being Southern or being American, but it's when I'm in these new situations and these new people are asking me things, that's when it, it seems to kind of create the need to create these distinctions. Um, I was recently in Norway and I found myself correcting people like, no, I'm not from Alabama, I'm from Louisiana. And then I realized that's completely meaningless to them, right? It, they don't care. But here, it does matter, yeah. And then when I realized that, then it was just like, yes, I'm from the United States. And that's all they care about. So. The study of identity is huge. It's, it's an enormous body of literature. It comes from different disciplines. There's psychologists and sociologists. Um, pretty much any discipline talks about identity. So if you are familiar with identity and I don't talk about your particular strain, forgive me. Um, the one that I am going to focus on, I guess I can zoom out, um, is on narrative identity. And narrative identity comes from this narrative turn, as some people say, that's occurring in the social sciences where we focus more on storytelling. And so the idea is that we create identities through stories, through storytelling. And, oh, oh I'm going the wrong way. And in this version, um, we create identities at three levels. We can create it at a macro level, and these are cultural identities. We can create it at a meso level, which are institutional identities, and then at a micro level, which is our personal identities. And now, it's possible to study each one of these separately, but really you get a better picture, uh, understanding of who people are when you, you look at multiple levels. Now, you don't always have to look at the meso level because sometimes we're not a part of institutions, but... so. At the macro level, these are our cultural identities. And if anybody, I know there's some people who have studied the social construction of social problems. There's a lot of overlap here with these cultural narratives. And in a cultural identity, these exist kind of out in the world. And they're these ideal categories of people. Um, when we talk about it, it's a way that we just simplify the world. There's, too many types of people out there, so we just classify them into groups and then we treat them like that group. So examples are meth heads, teen moms, conservative Christians, liberal professors. These are all types of people. And by talking about these, by hearing the stories of these types of people in the media and through conversation, we create what we call formula stories. And these formula stories just, they circulate out in the wild. And 
I like this quote. Some people don't like it because it's kind of repetitive, but I think that's the point of it. Is So formula stories are narratives of typical actors engaging in typical behaviors within typical plots leading to expectable moral evaluations. Right? So it's what we expect of certain types of people. Uh, right now, I think we are in the midst of a formula story of methamphetamine that is primarily driven by the faces of meth campaign. So when we think about a meth addict, I would imagine all of us went to poor rural whites who have bad teeth, who are erratic, and often violent. That becomes our image. That's what we think of meth users. But that's not how everyone sees meth users. Uh, people overseas, they don't have this image of the meth addict that we do. That's why I think it's primarily driven by that faces of meth campaign. And I'm sure most of you have seen it where they show the transition of a young meth user and then as they progressively get arrested, they show more mug shots and you just see the deterioration in their, their hair seems to be thinner, their teeth fall out, they have open sores. And that becomes a formula story of the meth user. And that shapes how we think about meth users. Um, on the show Breaking Bad, I read a lot of forums about Breaking Bad and such, and people criticize it because Jesse, one of the main meth dealers, has good teeth. And they don't think this is believable. How could he have good teeth? There's a lot of meth users who have okay teeth. But if we only rely on those formula stories, it kind of affects our expectations and assumptions of people. Now, these formula stories often center around these opposing groups. That's our in-group and our out-group. So we've got the functional user versus a dysfunctional user. And that's pretty much what I'll be talking about today, the differences and how they create these distinctions between a functional user who, of course, they claim they are versus these other dysfunctional users, but also fits with the authentic versus the inauthentic. So it's just a way that we just put people in an other category. And so by creating these cultural identities, it allows us to associate with that in-group, which means we get to take on those positive characteristics. And then it allows us to put others in the out-group, and then we get to attribute all the negative things to them. Then at the middle level, the meso level, is the organizational identities. And these are created by organizations whose main goal is to help change people's identities. Uh, this would be schools, halfway houses, treatment centers, prisons. And these organizations typically create their own formula stories. Now, often they borrow from larger cultural stories, but they often create their own. And these organizational formula stories about their clients or their patients or their students affect how organizational members treat them. It affects whether or not they're admitted, it affects if they are released. It affects how you interact with them. So since most of us teach college students, we have an organizational identity of certain types of students. Right? We we'll often hear people complain about the apathetic college student. And when we assign that label to someone, it really affects how we treat them. Right? I, I can't be the only one who gets an email and just automatically puts <laughs> that kid in the apathetic <laughs> category. Um, and, and so they're really I think one good distinction is in treatment centers. There's a lot of treatment centers that hold a medical model of addiction. And if that's their formula story, it's going to carry expectations of what should clients do in order to get out. Contrasted with a faith based center who doesn't see addiction as as a disease, but sees it more as kind of a, I don't know, spiritual cleansing. And, and so they have a different model and it affects how, it even affects how the, the, the participants talk about their treatment. So if you talk to people who are in these halfway houses that have, are faith-based, they talk about treatment a lot differently. They will tell you that they're saved and that God is the reason they are healthy. Whereas if you go to the other types of treatment centers, they usually don't have that strong of an emphasis. Now, they might talk about higher power, but it's not the main emphasis. But 
We're not talking about those. We're really talking about the micro level, and these are the personal identities. And these are the stories we tell to kind of put ourselves with a certain type of, uh, of category. And so often what we do is we rely on these formula stories to tell our own story. Um, one example is recently we, uh, we went to the Love Lady Center and we've been interviewing um, a lot of meth users. But this summer we decided let's talk to black women who use cocaine but not meth. Because again, our assumption, our formula story of the meth user is they're white. And ask these women, why don't you use meth? If you're willing to use cocaine, why not meth? And it appears that a lot of them rely on these formula stories. Uh, I think the main reason is they just don't have access. The people who make meth don't go to these communities, to black communities, to sell it. Because they're not familiar with it, they rely on the formula story. So now their perception of a meth user is they're erratic, they're, they're more prone to violence, and they lose their teeth. Um, they often talk about they don't want to use anything that has Drano in it or these other poisons because it does bad things to your body. Now clearly crack does bad things to your body as well. But I think because they see people in the community who can be functional crack users, that they get a more nuanced picture of what crack users are like. They don't see that those nuances with meth users, so they have to rely back on the formula story of the meth addict, and then that helps them explain why they don't do it. But we don't blindly apply formula stories. Uh, we, we adapt them to our situation. Uh, we alter them, we fit them, we manipulate them so that we still attach to it, but we show that we have complexity. And that's one of the key differences. The out group have no complexity. They, they lack agency. They're the people who, they're simplistic. There's, they fit the formula story, but I'm different. I'm complex. I, I, I'm more than just this story. So we use those to kind of um, create our own identities. Yeah. So based on this idea, the purpose of this research was to look at how crack users create identities using this formula story of the crack addict or the crackhead um, or the other names that they call them. And, and so the goal is to, one, explore the boundaries. How do they create or what's the nature of the boundaries that they create between themselves and the crackhead? And how does these boundaries, or, or, or the boundaries and, and the classification guide the way they interact with people they put in the out group? So that's the basic idea of what I'm, I'm trying to do here. And I will eventually press the right buttons the first time. So now you can see we're already in the middle. Um, for the methods, the bulk of my research is qualitative. And this project originally started as I was, I was simply going to interview violent offenders or robbers and ask about their decision-making process. Why did you decide to commit a robbery and how did you carry the robbery out? So pretty simple things. Um, but I began by trying to contextualize what is their life like? What's a, just a day in the life of a robber? And then how would that inform their decisions? And one of the early ones, I asked if he's used drugs and he said yes. I said, you smoke crack? He said yes. And I said, were you addicted? He said yes. And I said, so you were a crackhead? And he was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> and it was an emphatic no. And I thought, okay, that's interesting because in my formula story of the crack addict, if you're addicted, you're a crackhead. That, that was it. There was no distinctions made. But for these guys, that wasn't the case. And, and, and the strength of his opposition to that claim made me really think, okay, this is important to them. This is important to people like him. And so then I started to follow up more, not just with him, but with others uh, for the rest of the interviews, which is what I think is one of the, the good things about qualitative methods, that you can adapt as you go along. And, and so that really is what led to this project. And so it was 28 violent offenders. Uh, they were semi-structured interviews. Um, 
I use an inductive analysis, which essentially means I didn't go in there with the theory in place and then see if that theory fit. I really just listened to what they said, tried to figure out what they were saying. So I used the data to develop the theory rather than putting the theory on top of it. All right, and then what I find is that they classified themselves as hustlers. And, and so one of the things is when we, we tell people who we are, we often tell them who we are not. And for this group, they were not crackheads. They were hustlers, right? And th this brings up different connotations that fall along these five boundaries. And the first one is the idea of being clean. They portrayed crackheads as dirty in every sense of the word. They were morally dirty. They were physically dirty. Uh, they carried diseases. They didn't keep themselves up. Um, so what, what I have here just to explain is a brief description of what I think the, the concept means. And then I put some quotes from the participants. I'm not going to read the quotes because I often give them accents and I don't want to do that on film. Um, so I, they all sound like they're from South Louisiana because that's where I did the interviews. But I'll kind of just talk a little bit about them and I'll leave them up there. So as this one offender talks about, they just look bad. They're all strung out. Um, they don't keep up with themselves. Um, they describe them. Here's a, a depiction of the physical characteristics is that their lips turn white and they start shaking because they're always trying to get the drug. And, and to them, that's at the bottom. So as long as you can use crack but still maintain a certain amount of cleanliness, then you can distance yourself from a crackhead. Uh, now, they wouldn't even, they try to avoid interactions, and I'll get to that more, but especially sexual interactions. You don't really want to sleep with a crackhead. I don't know why I needed to point that out, right? <laughs> that should be obvious. Um, the next theme is, is having things. A lot of street offenders live in a world that, that really values a certain style and a certain look. And if you can have those symbolic displays, then you can show that you're a certain type of person, that you're a hustler and not a crackhead. And so one of the things that they pointed out, for, well, the, the first one is he never considered himself a junkie until he went to prison, right? So now he gets this shift in his um, identity because when he was on the street, he had things, right? He, he didn't have to do all these demeaning acts. He had money for his drugs. It was okay. Uh, the, they portray the, the crackhead as, as more desperate. And one of them I asked, he, he robbed a crackhead or ripped them off. And I said, you didn't fear retaliation because retaliation is big amongst this group of people. And he said, no, he's a crackhead. And I said, well, what if he had a gun? And he said, he's a crackhead. If he ever had a gun, he would have sold it by now. So that becomes that even if they ever did have things, if they were able to acquire something, they've sold it or pawned it or traded it by now. Uh, the paper that this is based on is titled, We Weren't Like No Regular Dope Fiends, right? because they had money. A dope fiend, crackheads, they didn't have these things. They also like to portray themselves kind of in this cool, detached um, demeanor. And so that if they're confronted or they're put into a, a risky situation, they, they can kind of overcome it. They can, they can face it with uh, some degree of, of character. Whereas crackheads, you really can't describe a crackhead as cool because according to them, they're always paranoid, they're erratic, they're sketchy. There's just something not right about them. So he calls them cluckers. It wasn't just him. This is kind of a common term um, because they're always bobbing their heads like they're chickens, right? And, and, and there's really nothing cool about looking like that. 
Um, and, and so the idea that they're, they're scared is because they can't face these same situations. If someone confronted them, they would back down because they're, they're terrified, whereas a hustler would face it head on. They're not going to back down. Uh, they're also criminally able. Um, they believe that they possessed um, a larceny sense, which is kind of an old term that really just means that some people have the ability to recognize criminal opportunities better than the rest of us. Uh, they can see who a mark is, they can see who police are, they can see when there's money to be made, whereas crackheads did not have this ability. They were left just doing petty crimes, just scrounging, stealing scrap metal. So pretty much any time you hear of someone stealing copper or metal, those are the crackheads, according to these, <laughs> these guys. Um, oh, and then they do some things that other horrible <laughs> things for money. Um, for the first one, I thought this was interesting because his example of a petty crime was they go and steal a lawnmower. Someone stole my lawnmower. It was a push mower, not even adjustable. It had to be a crackhead, right? Who else is going <laughs> to? Who else would steal this? Because you couldn't get five bucks for I, I don't know. <laughs> crackhead, or not crackhead. They also portrayed themselves as having heart. This kind of gets back to the idea that they have courage. They'll stand up for themselves. Um, hustlers will use violence when disrespected whereas crackheads won't um, because, as I say, there's something about the drug. It does something to them. It, it, it kind of takes their heart away. It takes their courage away, and they don't want any trouble. They're cluckers. You can beat them anytime you want. You can hate them. And they, he hates them because of this, because they don't stand up for themselves. That kind of weak-willed is not valued amongst this group. Oh, that was all five of them, I, I thought. Uh, went quicker than I thought. So in the first part, they use language, they tell stories, and that helps create these boundaries between themselves and crackheads. But it's more than just language. It, it, they also reinforce these boundaries or maintain these boundaries by how they treat people they put into the crackhead category. So when they interact with crackheads, they do so in, in specific ways. One, they typically just try to avoid them, but if this is your lifestyle where you are smoking crack and you're dealing crack and you're, you're going to run into these people. So you keep your interactions to a minimum. You don't have relationships with them. You might sell dope or buy dope or, as Dr. Sloan said, rent a car from them, but you don't really want to interact with them. You're not friends with them, right, because then that kind of taints you. That'll put you kind of make other people maybe think that you're in that category as well. Um, a lot of their interactions are based on humiliating and demeaning the crackhead. They told a lot of horrible stories about how they treat crackheads. Um, some of them are, are just so bad that I figured these capture how bad it is without really having to go into the really horrible things they do to them. Um, one, just to mess with them, because they could, they would get them to a crackhead to put his hand in an ant pile. Ants hurt, I, you know. I know they have them in Alabama. They certainly have them in Louisiana. And so they were willing to do this just for a little rock. Um, this one guy just decided he was going to hit him with a tire. Just no reason other than just pretty much to make the guys he was hanging out with laugh. Um, one of the stories, they convinced the crackhead to go and steal something from the back of a truck. And then when he was doing that, they went to the guy and said, hey, that guy's stealing your stuff, just so they could watch the crackhead get beat up. Uh, they convinced one to jump off a building and he broke his ankles. So pretty much if you are able to do this to someone else, that really reinforces the boundary that you're not in that group. And then sometimes they do have them do these menial tasks. Right? Here, um, if you are hiding out either from the police or some 
rivals who w want to hurt you. Uh, you can just pay crackheads to go do your shopping and do whatever. You just give them a little bit. And this is also where they rent cars, right? So they give a crackhead whatever amount, or a crack user, whatever amount, and they borrow the car for some degree, agreed upon time. And interestingly, they usually bring the car back. It's more common to bring the car back than to just steal it because they might want to do this again. All right, so... What we see is that crack users recognize that they're physically and socially close to the crackheads. And because of this, it's really important to maintain those boundaries, right? So if we're trying to make a distinction between I'm from Louisiana and I'm from Alabama, that's not really that important of a distinction. So I don't really have to reinforce this. But if someone might mistake me for a crackhead, then I would really want to reinforce those boundaries. So they rely on these formula stories about what a crackhead is. Right? So crackheads are typical actors. So these are, they're dirty, they're incapable, they're weak, they are slaves to their drug, and it forces them to engage in demeaning acts. And then the expectable moral outcome is that they should be humiliated. They should be demeaned because they're not worth it. Whereas I am criminal, criminally able. I have the style and the character of a good hustler. And therefore, you should treat me accordingly. And if you don't treat me accordingly, then I'll use violence to kind of maintain the, a certain degree of respect. So, I did it. One of the, the last things I'll talk about is there are benefits of using these formula stories that we, we can see from not just this study, but other studies. And, and one of them is that pretty much what we've talked about today is that it allows you to create a positive sense of self. Right? You can either attach yourself to a, a valued formula story, a type, or you can distance yourself from a stigmatized one. So these guys could have the steam because they were hustlers. They were not like the other group. The other group was beneath them. It also facilitates understanding or questions behavior. So when someone asks us, why did you do that? We often don't really give them a full explanation. We just give them bits of the formula story. We give them the plot and then we fill in the rest. The listener fills in the rest. I, I think uh, good example for uh, professionals is why are you leaving the university? I'm doing it for my family. That's it. Now we know. We can fill in the rest of the story. We don't have to keep questioning them. And so it allows us to just kind of smooth over conversations. Um, one of the things we find is that a lot of times when we interview people, they don't have, they try to have coherent stories, but if you talk to them long enough, there's really fractured stories. And I think the reason researchers find more fractured stories is because in our usual conversation, we just throw out the formula story plot and our listener says, okay, and then we move on. But the researcher just keeps going and keeps asking, which then makes someone who maybe didn't really think out all the answers, now they have to struggle and try to fill in the gap. And that's when we start seeing all the fractures and the inconsistencies. Um, it also aids in um, giving people direction and, and allowing to make a decision and in excusing their behavior. So in a sense, the, the formula stories can come before the behavior. So if you're unsure of what to do, well, what would a crackhead do? I'm not going to do that. What does a hustler do? That's what I'll do. Um, and it can come after the fact, right? Perhaps we just did something and someone said, why'd you do it? And then we get to excuse it by referencing the formula story because that's what people like me do. And so even if that wasn't the real reason, we can still kind of offer that reason and it kind of smooths over the interaction. Now, before I move on to kind of some of the things that I'm planning in the future, I don't want to reify these concepts. I don't want to make it seem like these are real concepts, that there's real crackheads and these people are real hustlers. This is just a social construct. It, it, they're not real. 
And you can't, it's difficult to really put someone in a group. So for instance, the, the rock rentals, that's what they call when they borrow a car for crack. Apparently in Birmingham they call it dope pawns, but in Louisiana it was rock rentals. Some of them said they did that. They loaned their car as evidence that they weren't crackheads. Right? So they didn't have to go and do demeaning acts. They didn't have to put their hand in an ant pile or jump off a building or have sex with someone. They just loaned their car. And that became their method of saying, I'm not a crackhead. Whereas a lot of the people who borrowed the car said, oh yeah, that's a crackhead because they loaned me the car. So it's the same behavior, but it kind of people use it differently depending on how they see themselves and the person that they're interacting with. So recognize these are not real concepts. They're just kind of these ideal types that we use to create boundaries between one another. And so what we're working on now is uh, we've just finished a paper on women meth users and how they construct boundaries. And we have one of the co-authors here, <laughs> Jessica. And we look at a very similar thing about how do women meth users create this distinction from the functional and dysfunctional. But then we go a little bit further and we look at what we find is that even if you say you're in a category, sometimes you don't act accordingly. Sometimes you can say you're functional, but then you do dysfunctional things. And so now you're left with a choice. Do you accept, all right, I'm now dysfunctional, I'm now a meth head, or I'm now a crackhead, or do you justify that behavior and say, yeah, that's typically crackhead behavior, but this time it's not because I had a real reason, so I'm still, I'm still okay. And so we look at how do they account for these um, kind of boundary slippages, is what we're calling them. And then we're also starting a new project with another co-author, Hayden, in the back, about how college students misuse psychostimulants. And one of the things we're looking at is how do they rely on these cultural stories of expectations of the middle class college student um, and really these ideas of success and moderation. And then how do they use that to kind of create distinctions between themselves as Adderall users, which is an amphetamine, and other amphetamine users who are meth addicts or illegal drug users. And that is where we are heading now.